does mild hyperbaric have an effect on inflammation? Or do we need to go to higher pressures in order to see that response inside of our body? There are some people in the industry that say lower pressure, mild hyperbarics just does not have any meaningful effect in our body. There are other people in the industry that say mild pressure hyperbarics has the exact same effects as high pressure hyperbarics. Why would you go to higher pressures? It's unnecessary. This has been an argument inside the industry ever since soft chambers and mild hyperbarics were introduced 20 or 25 years ago. Today, I'm gonna to discuss my research findings that were designed to answer this very question as it relates to inflammation and inflammatory cytokines that we could measure inside of our body. So this video is video two of a series that I'm doing reporting on the outcomes of the research project that I finished as part of my PhD program over the last few years. If you missed the first video, which actually goes into detail of the study, the study design, and what we were looking at, click this one, watch that one first, because that's gonna give you the overview. This video being number two is looking specifically at the cytokine effect that we found inside of this research project. Just as a quick summary, being in this industry and teaching hyperbaric medicine now for a number of years, the question I probably get the most is, does 1.3 ATA do anything at all? Do we need higher pressure? Is more pressure better? Is the only way to get an effective dose of hyperbaric to go to two atmospheres or more? And the answer clinically was, I don't think so, because we've been using lower pressure and higher pressure now for over 20 years in my clinics, and we see different effects from both. So I know that there's some effect, but I could never really give a very specific number or really point to the research because that is an area that has been lacking. So quite honestly, the purpose of this research was just to evaluate a number of different measurements and compare lower pressure and higher pressure just to see what would happen. We started out with an N of 30, so 30 participants, 10 in the mild pressure group, 10 in the high pressure group, 10 in the control group. It was a double-blind, randomized control trial. The treatment groups got 50 hours of therapy altogether, spread out over two five-week periods, getting three times a week, 100 minutes for five weeks, a month off and then another three times a week, 100 minutes each session for another five weeks. After that therapy was complete, the control group was then randomized half into the mild pressure group, half into the high pressure group, and then they went through the exact same therapy journey. Our measurement points were done at baseline before therapy ever started, after the first round of five weeks of therapy, after the second round of five weeks of therapy, and then four weeks post. And the subjects in the study had to be between 40 and 70 years old, and they had to be asymptomatic and undiagnosed. As it relates to the cytokines or inflammation, I believe that most of us are more inflamed than we should be for optimum health. And so I wanted to see, does low pressure and high pressure have a statistical significant impact on inflammation on otherwise healthy individuals or the subjects for this particular study? What I thought we would find would be that the lower pressure and higher pressure would have almost the same impact in terms of which markers are being affected through hyperbaric therapy, but ultimately that the higher pressure group would have a higher impact in a shorter period of time, and the lower pressure group would have a smaller impact over a longer period of time. And while we did actually find that on some of the markers, we also found a few surprises. So of the 81 cytokines that we tested, in the mild pressure group, 21 of them were statistically significant. We'll show you a chart of what those look like. On this chart, you'll see which biomarker we're talking about, in the next column, you'll see its p-value or its statistical significance. In the next two columns, you'll see the mean pre-test value and then the mean post-test value. All of these were done at 14 weeks. So these measurements that I'm showing you today were baseline versus post their second five weeks of treatment. To me, some of the more interesting ones that were affected in this mild pressure group were markers like interleukin-6, interleukin-8, TNF-alpha, TNF-beta, these were more statistically significant in the mild pressure group than they were in the high pressure group. That's one of the surprises here. It wasn't just that both groups had similar impact on similar set of data points. There were overlap, which I'll show you in a few minutes, but the lower pressure group had a more statistically significant impact on certain markers. And the higher pressure group had a much more statistically significant impact on a different set of markers. So there were overlap, but the lower pressure group affected certain cytokines much more so than the higher pressure group, and the higher pressure group also had a set of data points that were more statistically significant than the mild pressure group. So in terms of the higher pressure group, here's a chart showing you the 20 
cytokines of the 81 that we measured that were statistically significant for the 2.0 at 100% oxygen. Some of the more interesting ones to me here are interleukin-7, interleukin-9, myeloperoxidase, and interferon. Before I go into a little bit more detail about what are the implications of some of these numbers or markers, I also just want to show you this chart. And this is just showing you some of the more impactful mild pressure cytokines that were affected, some of the more important higher pressure markers that were affected, and the ones in the middle, which were found to be statistically significant, both in the mild pressure as well as the higher pressure group. So what does all this mean? First and foremost, what it actually means to me is that a lot more research needs to be done. We should be looking at a variety of different pressures. Now that we know which markers in general are being affected, we could start expanding on which pressures are affecting which one. 1 1.3, 1.5, 1.75, 2.0, 2.2, 2.4. .2 and this is going to help us develop much more meaningful protocols. We'll get right back to the video in a minute. I just wanted to quickly share that the hyperbaric textbook that Dr. Joe DeTore and I have been working on for the last 18 months is finally available and ready for order. As most of you know, I've been teaching and certifying people in hyperbaric medicine for the last few years, and I have felt like what was missing was a concise book to describe everything that we cover in our courses. Is it a substitute for the course? Absolutely not. Is it a great addition to the course? Definitely is. And if you can't get to one of our courses yet, is it a great place to really jumpstart your hyperbaric education? Yes, absolutely. So just click the link in the description below and grab your copy today. The other implication of this is now we could start to see that certain pressures are having effect in different areas of the immune system. Our immune system is incredibly complex. There are parts of our immune system that are responding or creating an inflammatory response. There's part of our immune system that's helping us fight infection. There's part of our immune system that's helping to try to regulating the balance of all of these cytokines inside of our immune system. Autoimmunity is one example, would be a consequence when the immune system gets out of balance. And so one of the really important things that we can learn from this, number one, is that all versions of hyperbaric are having an impact. So we can no longer say this one does and this one doesn't or vice versa. We also can understand that they're having different types of impact. So we can't say that this one's just better and it has a better impact and this one's having a lesser or no impact. They're each having their own different types of impact inside of our system. And I think one of the most important things we can do once we develop a little bit more research in this direction is we could start to understand specific issues that patients are dealing with. We could measure specific cytokines that are going to be depressed or elevated in certain patients, and then we can develop protocols based on which cytokines we're trying to have an effect on. Some people may need lower pressure first for a period of time and then develop a tolerance and the ability to handle higher pressure. Maybe some people need more higher pressure first, and then they can transition into more of a lower pressure over a period of time, maybe for maintenance. But I think what this is telling us mostly is that hyperbaric lives on a continuum of the most mild version you could imagine, you know, 1.3, let's say air only, all the way to three atmospheres on 100% oxygen. And rather than just picking one pressure and one protocol and fitting all of our patients into that specific program, we can start to assess our patients differently and then deliver the most effective version of hyperbaric for them based on their concerns, based on their goals, and based on the testing that we do to understand what they need from our clinics. So I hope you find these results as interesting as I do. There's more to come. I'm gonna be sharing more of the research details over the next few videos. So thanks again for your time and attention, and I look forward to sharing the rest of the series with you over the next few weeks. Whether you're a chiropractor, or a naturopath, or an acupuncturist, or a DO, or even an MD, but you're looking at hyperbarics through this lens, the lens that I'm describing, which is applying hyperbarics for all these off-label conditions, this is the class that teaches that. And right now it's the only class that teaches this type of hyperbarics in this way, and that's an actual certification course. Check out hbotusa.com, and uh, right across the, the top you'll see upcoming events. You can click on that, and it'll show you uh, when our next courses are gonna be.